Hello, bonjour and ahoy. On Tuesday evening, we hosted the Globesec Award Ceremony at the Bratislava Castle, where we awarded the annual Czech and Slovak Transatlantic Award to both General John Allen and Václav Havel in memoriam. And here are the highlights from day two. We kicked off the day on the main stage, hearing from the Foreign Affairs Minister of Slovakia and Austria, as well as the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister of Italy on how to strengthen Europe's role on the international stage. Staying on the subject of European diplomacy, we heard from the Foreign Affairs Minister of Croatia, North Macedonia and Slovenia on their respective trajectories towards achieving an ever greater European integration. This was followed by a lively discussion among foreign affairs ministers of the Visegrad Four, which included Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic and Slovakia. Mayors from Bratislava and Budapest, as well as a voice from the Czech Republic, discussed the reactions of cities to the pandemic and the need to improve communications with government and generate more capacity in times of crisis. With the meeting between Biden and Putin taking place, experts from Russia, the EU and North America speculated on the potential outcomes and what to look for. Finally, we ended the day by hearing from renowned thinker Francis Fukuyama about the need to rebuild the foundations of democracy and trust throughout societies. Our list of international expert and renowned thinkers is far from over, so stay tuned for more video highlights and recaps. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator of the last day at Globsec 2021, Julia Belus. Hello, everyone. So welcome to, to this session um, and a very warm welcome to the panelists who are coming in from all over, I guess, Europe and the UK. Um, my name is Julia Blues. I'm a senior health correspondent at Vox, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I think we're talking about one of the most important issues of the pandemic, um, how to build trust in vaccines in an environment where it's kind of exceptionally diff difficult to know who or what to trust. Um, not only do we have this kind of onslaught of information and scientific knowledge coming at us at all, at all times, but we also have to deal with bad actors who are spreading misinformation and disinformation. And so the focus today is on how to fight um, information insecurity. And we have uh, a distinguished panel to help us. So I'll start with the, the person who's joining us from beautiful Bratislava. Um, Miroslava Saviris is the senior research fellow in the Democracy and Resilience Program in the Globsec Policy Institute here in Bratislava. Um, we also have Henry Collis, who's joining us from London. Um, he is the Deputy Director of National Security Communications in the UK Cabinet Office, where he co-leads cross-government planning and delivery of communication activity to achieve the UK's national security objectives. Um, we also have Melinda Frost, who's joining us from Geneva um, in the World Health Organization. She's the leader of the Translate Science team and working on the info, infodemic management COVID-19 response at WHO. And so today, um, like the um, infodemic, we have questions coming at us from all angles. So people will be um, submitting questions via Zoom, uh, via the Globsec app. And of course, um, for everyone in the room, you can stand up um, or raise your hand when you have a question and go to the microphone there um, when you're called on. And so I think the, f the best way to start the panel today is to kind of give, it, give a sense to the audience of the problem, the scale of the problem. Um, and I thought from your various vantage points, we could talk about how the misinformation or disinformation campaigns you're tracking are affecting the vaccine rollout. Um, and maybe we could start with Miroslava. Thank you very much, Julia, also for this kind introduction. 
So when we speak about the infodemic and, and uh, disinformation affecting vaccine rollout, I think the obvious uh, answer would be that, yes, obviously, disinformation does affect uh, rollout of the vaccination. But then we also can't make sweeping generalizations. I think it's much better in some countries, you know, some countries where obviously conspiracy theories about COVID-19 are not so prominent, such as, for example, in Austria, um, there, according to our Globsec uh, Trends 2021 data, we see that actually the disinformation campaigns do not have such an effect because um, the vaccination rollout there is more successful than in other CEE countries, um, such as, for example, Romania or Bulgaria, where you have quite um, large prominence of some COVID-19 related conspiracy theories. So we do see this this link uh, between between conspiracy theories uh, about COVID-19 or disinformation and and vaccination rollout. But also, I would like to um, just stress or point out that when we speak about disinformation and conspiracy theories, we often um, imagine, you know, the trolls in, in St. Petersburg spreading disinformation, which is absolutely true. This has been a uh, part of, of uh, rollout of some vaccines uh, were really target of, of uh, strong uh, disinformation campaigns or information operations seeking to discredit some of these vaccines, particularly the AstraZeneca vaccine. But um, in the information ca chaos, that is the infodemic. We have also seen that public figures have sometimes um, you know, wittingly or unwittingly provided incorrect information to the public. Um, we can mention, you know, the former president Donald Trump and, and, and his advice to general populations on how to treat COVID-19, which was factually incorrect. Um, or even sometimes I think mainstream media um, have some, in some cases, struggled a bit with reporting on, on the vaccination. For example, in Slovakia, we had a case where basically on a primetime TV at 8 p.m. when, you know, um, the, the, the whole, let's say, nation watches TV in the evening, um, we had this one case of a woman dying uh, shortly after receiving jab um, from AstraZeneca vaccine. And um, this report basically make a direct, made a direct link between this jab and between um, the resulting death of, of this lady. Later on, it was discovered that the death was not related to the vaccine and that also, you know, the reporter who was, uh, who was basically responsible for producing the story was her relative. So there was obviously some kind of a bias involved as well. But, you know, the damage has been done. And then when you have these kind of stories promulgated in the information space, it's very difficult for, um, for anybody to really navigate what is true and what isn't true anymore. So. Right. And I'd, I'd love to bring in um, Melinda in Geneva, who has kind of this global overview, because you're seeing yeah, that it's not just, um, it's not even just yeah, online or public figures. There's also this world of offline and impenetrable networks of, of disinformation being spread. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you. Thank you, Julia. And I completely agree with the, the, the um, things that Mar uh, Miroslava had mentioned as well, that it's a pretty complicated issue, particularly when it comes to vaccines. Um, we've always known that communicating vaccines, even during non-emergencies and rolling out new vaccines can introduce a lot of concerns and questions and valid questions on the part of a population. But now during COVID-19, when you pull in the mix of changing science, um, eminent threat to some individuals concern and things are just changing. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, people have questions and concerns. So this is sort of a ripe field for myths and disinformation. And I'm really excited to see that we have a session on uh, focused on infodemics. This is something that the World Health Organization has really uh, pushed the envelope on. We started an infodemics management pillar as part of the COVID-19 response at the very beginning within the first month of the response in 2020. So this has been an area of focus for us. So we've been trying to track misinformation and disinformation and really learn more about how to respond to that 
in order to address people's concerns. Uh, what we see a lot when it comes to disinformation is, um, or, or during any emergency is essentially that people will sort of revert back to the information sources that they trust. Those may be individuals, they may be um, mass media, traditional media, they may be social media. And then I think what we found too during COVID-19, particularly as countries began to do lockdowns too, people were turning a little bit more towards social media. And as people were uncertain and uh, more stressed because of the situation of COVID-19, they sought more information to relieve that stress. And yet what we think and what studies are beginning, beginning to show is that actually caused more stress because there were more confusions, particularly when they were trying to seek information with online sources. So WH is doing quite a bit of work around this to, to, to figure out more about how to track misinformation, disinformation, uh, learn more about how we um, combat that and how we can respond to that to uh, decrease that, that conversation online and how to pre-bunk, how to get information, good information out before uh, disinformation and misinformation has a chance to really grow uh, within the information ecosphere. So a lot, a lot of work going on around this, and and I'm glad we're talking about vaccines today. This is a, you know the most important issue right now. But just to say too, we've been tracking mis and disinformation just in the COVID-19 response too, in terms of uh, cures or prevention methods. Uh, so this has been something we've been doing again for about 18 months and uh, or we're learning quite a bit. And I can talk maybe a little bit later in the program about what the future holds for WHO and infodemics. Thank you, Melinda. And Harry, can you give us the view from London? Yes, of course. Um, I think it's um, uh, important to sort of draw out a couple of the things that uh, my esteemed uh, pa uh, fellow panelists mentioned. Uh, and in particular, it's this, this underlying issue of, of trust. And I think it's important to acknowledge um, that disinformation doesn't create, um, create divisions or create um, uh, these kind of beliefs. But what it does is, is land an environment where it exacerbates them. And it really, uh, different actors with different motivations really um, try to exploit that for, for uh, their own purposes. And when we're looking at the issue here, I think you know it does come down to trust, but we need to disaggregate exactly what that trust is in. Uh, trust in this context is not just about trust in the product, i.e. the vaccine, um, but it's also very much about trust in the institutions that are developing, supplying, uh, and administering um, the vaccine and belief that those institutions have um, public interest and interest of different groups at heart. Um, and of course, this is all happening in a context that I know uh, Globsex discussed at, at length in previous years, which is a, a general trend of declining trust uh, in, in government institutions uh, worldwide. And that's sort of widely highlighted in a number of surveys, but notably, of course, the Edelman Trust Barometer. Um, so we need to make sure that we are working in a way that um, understands exactly how we can overcome those barriers with different groups. Uh, and I, I think about the challenge here as being one of uh, supply and demand uh, for accurate information. And uh, when it comes to how we use strategic communications, part of what we need to do is to actually create demand for accurate information. And there are a number of campaigns and activities that uh, the UK has, has developed and worked on with our partners to help uh, uh, nudge um, uh, populations to seek out accurate information, but also to, to be able to detect inaccurate uh, information. Um, and then, of course, on the supply side, um, it's a case of ensuring that accurate information is brought to those audiences in a way that they find trustful. Domestically in the UK, uh, we've, uh, we're lucky enough to enjoy sort of high levels of vaccine confidence overall, with over 70% uh, of the UK population um, saying they would accept the vaccine. And of course, when you look at how the, uh, the, the vaccine hesitant population actually breaks out according to different demographic categories, you'll find that that's significantly higher in certain, um, in certain groups. So it's a case of finding the trusted messengers um, that we can that we can bring them accurate information uh, with. Um, so 
the view from the UK domestically, I think, is that you know we we um, are lucky enough to enjoy relatively overall high levels of vaccine confidence, and we're working to find the best way to uh, encourage confidence among those uh, other groups, uh, whilst also uh, recognizing that we can work with our partners around the world to uh, use strategic communications to boost vaccine confidence in a number of different ways, um, including through working with the World Health Organization. And Henry, you mentioned trusted messengers, and I'm curious where, where you've seen the most success um, like I, I remember there was a great campaign, was it Elton John you had advocating for, for getting the jab and you, you've kind of drawn on yeah, to everything from celebrities to, to obviously yeah, other public leaders. So I'm curious um, where, where you've, what, what you've seen are particularly successful campaigns or messengers, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Uh, no, celebrities are, are great, and particularly when you're thinking about, you know, appealing to to, um, to finding uh, individuals that resonate with specific audiences, and they have quite broad appeal. Um, and when we think about youth audiences, of course, it's a great way to engage them because, you know, they're not going to be necessarily listening to mainstream news, and they don't want to hear from politicians. Um, so you can find people that, you know, sports stars, musicians, that they really, uh, that they already follow on social media, and they're going to they're going to pick up that. Uh, content just through their routine sort of um, um, information consumption activity, but I think th the most important ones aren't the aren't the high profile ones, and it's actually bringing the messaging down um, to the uh, to as local a level as possible, and finding individuals that are influential influential with specific communities like uh, religious leaders, uh, health professionals. Um, so just anecdotally, as I. Um, uh, walk out of my stairwell in my building in the morning and I live in uh, a central area of London, very diverse communities. And so there's an image of uh, an imam uh, who works in the local community uh, talking uh, about his confidence in the vaccine uh, on a poster in the stairwell. And it's, you know, bringing these very local voices that are recognized in small communities um, to the fore uh, that is essential to build trust. I imagine that's a challenge for an organization like the WHO that's working globally. Like when just covering this issue over a decade, you see how um, even making generalizations about vaccine hesitancy in a country are difficult because it's so t these these um, yeah pockets of refusal tend to be pockets like extremely local and um, with with very specific um, community based concerns. Mm -hmm. um, no. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think uh, from the World Health Organization at the, the global level, every time we communicate anything, we have to think, who are we communicating to now? Is it the 15-year-old in Kenya? Is it the, you know, 75-year-old grandmother in Costa Rica? Um, we, we have a huge audience. And so it does, um, and I think Miroslava mentioned this earlier too, just it, it, the vaccine hesitancy in particular is, is a very, very nuanced issue. It's, it's the, somebody's questioning the vaccine could be very valid. Um, I think a lot of what we're seeing actually in, in Europe right now um, isn't so much people questioning the vaccine, although there is some of that. Uh, it's people's ease of access to get to the vac get vaccine. It's not as easy in some locations to get it as it is others. Um, but just to touch on what Henry was mentioning in terms of trusted sources of information. This is something that the WHO has been working on. And even prior to COVID-19, we started a network called the um, WHO Information Network for Epidemics. And the sole purpose of this uh, network, we call it EpiWin, was to be able to reach out through trusted sources of information. And we really are targeting three um, um, partner networks. One is youth uh, to reach out to this very unique population. It's critically important now uh, during vaccine because with the vaccine rollout of COVID-19, we're, we're, we're targeting populations that aren't usually targeted for vaccines. So it's a unique situation in that respect. Um, we also are working through um, faith organizations as well and working side by side with them. We've done some very exciting initiatives where we've co-written guidance together with faith organizations to better target uh, their trusted constituents um, through these methods. And we work, of course, all over the world, so very, very different circumstances and different countries and, 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 and communities as well. And we're also working through the business sector because we've known from the past, as Henry indicated, 
through Edelman uh, barometer trust that that oftentimes people really trust information that are coming from their employer networks as well. So we've tried to work through those mechanisms as well. Um, in terms of choice of vaccine, we're seeing that um, globally and also in Europe too, uh, female population is often a little bit more hesitant than male population. So we're trying to kind of work around that issue as well. And um, yeah, I think at this point, it's, it's we're beyond the global messaging on this. Everything has to become much, much more nuanced. And we're really targeting efforts around community engagement and empowerment, community-led initiatives to reach out to individuals, to have those individual conversations so that people can truly get their very valid questions answered through trusted, trusted networks. I and mean, that can often be the healthcare providers as well. Wonderful. And I, I want to turn to solutions in a moment. But first, um, we have some research from Miroslava <laughs> in a poll. Um, so what proportion can, can, can we bring up the poll, actually, so everyone can see it? There we go. So what proportion of the adult population across Central and Eastern Europe believe that COVID is a planned operation or conspiracy by the hidden forces and elites to control the population? Um, if everyone could submit an answer, 8%, 18%, 28%, 38%. Uh, how long do we usually give for these polls of our precious time? I think it's out there, yeah. Oh, there we go, okay. Okay, interesting. So I can say that people are a bit more optimistic than they should be. Okay. <laughs> so it's not 18% across CEE, it's actually 28% across CEE. So it's fairly, fairly large proportion of the population. and. Um, the reason why we looked at this uh, so-called pandemic conspiracy theory is because um, we wanted to, by you know, observing what's going on on social media, because you know, pandemic and this kind of, um, let's say, what should be fringe conspiracy theories are not generally seen on mainstream media in most of the CE countries. Um, so this is something that's definitely being um, perpetuated online. And we just wanted to kind of test the impact of the you know, digital environment on, on the way we form our opinions about, about the pandemic. And obviously, again, this is an average number for whole CEE. So it's worse in some countries and, and better in some countries. But it just goes to show you the power that these types of um, conspiracy theories have. And it's quite also interesting that you see this perpetuation of um, disinformation narratives about COVID-19 globally. So whereas before, you know, the digital revolution, conspiracy theories were always kind of part of our lives. Let's not pretend that it was ever any different. But what we see right now is this perpetuation of conspiracy theories, which are truly global. So um, something that Alex Jones from Infowars was uh, adamantly, you know, um, promoting in the US was professionally voiced over into Slovak, a very professional oh, wow. actor. Um, yes, very nicely sounding voiceover. And it was a video shared on Facebook, which was shared 16,000 times, which by Slovak standards is like extremely large number. And obviously um, Facebook um, uh, did in cooperation with independent fact checkers, ch fact checked this video. And it always came with this little disclaimer, you know, that the information in this video is factually incorrect, but that didn't really stop the promotion of the video. And so then you see all these um, basically perpetuation of conspiracy theories from all kinds of, you know, corners of the world. And they um, influence very specific local communities, which previously they wouldn't actually be able, wouldn't actually be able to reach. So I just wanted to also by showing this poll um, demonstrate um, the power of disinformation and the power of conspiracy theories and uh, obviously the issues that this poses to vaccination efforts and um, to just overcoming the pandemic. And we, we have a question from the audience that's, that's related. Um, so, so someone, oh, we have another question from the audience. Okay, we'll do the first question. <laughs> so what are some of the dividing lines between those who are more and less prone to believing um, or to being disinformed and misinformed? 
Um, we've talked about yeah, a lot of the things that we're drawing in are these longer term challenges like trust in government, maybe educational gaps. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if yeah, what we're learning now in the pandemic, um, yeah, where, where, where these dividing lines might fall. That's a very good question. And again, it's not as easy as it seems like um, intuitively, we would say that, you know, it's always people with lower education who believe in conspiracy theories more or um, that it's people in rural areas, but this isn't always the case. So when we look at different countries, the picture is quite different, or sometimes it's the younger generation who is more prone than the older generation, which also seems kind of counterintuitive. So how we were talking, um, Melinda and Henry both quite correctly pointing out that strategic communication requires tailoring, that you need to tailor a specific message to the audience that you're targeting because that will resonate. And in a similar way, this information works too. So it's sort of like, you know, the dark side of the information spectrum. Mm -hmm. So certain um, types of disinformation or certain types of conspiracy theories resonate among different sections of the population more. And we know many examples of this and often, um, as Henry pointed out, they feed into pre-existing fears or even legitimate grievances. So, for example, um, you know, um, the conspiracy theory that has been spread in the past about about the HIV virus, uh, that, you know, um, there was a conspiracy theory that basically uh, it has been invented, you know, um, this has been spread by, uh, by pro-Russian actors that, that this um, HIV virus was produced by the US, you know, and so in some parts of, of Africa, these types of conspiracy theories can, reson can resonate for, for different reasons, you know, or for example, conspiracy or disinformation about migration resonates strongly in Hungary because of, um, you know, um, the current regime, because of the migration crisis that has been blown out right. of proportion. But when you look at um, disinformation about COVID-19 in Hungary, actually, you will find that Hungary is one, one of the more resistant countries towards this type of misinformation. And you will see that other countries such as in the Western Balkans or even in Slovakia uh, is much more receptive to, to these types of uh, um, conspiracy theories, and yes, it has got to do a lot with with trust in institutions, or mistrust in in, in government or or in mainstream media. So right. it depends. And, <laughs> one, and one dividing line that Melinda brought up is the the gender dividing line, which I I didn't realize was a. It sounds like it's a global issue that that women are more hesitant than men. And do we understand? Yeah, what do we understand about that? I don't think we quite understand everything about that. And it's just a slight trend that we're seeing that I think is sort of surprising a lot of us. Um, potentially, maybe Henry knows more about the situation in the UK. Um, but I do want to kind of bridge off of what Miroslava was saying in terms of this divide. And I, th I think a, a lot of our gut reactions before this would have been um, again, trust in government, trust in leaders. That's what we've sort of always known during an emergency. You, you can't build trust in the middle of an emergency. It has to be the foundation from which you start prior to an emergency. Um, so if there was a foundation of maybe not even lack of trust in the government, but just maybe a bad experience with the public health system, um, that's going to affect people's perception um, on whether or not you know, responders have their best interests in mind have the capability to manage this and get their questions answer, answered and, and really understand the lives in which people are, are leading. And this is um, coming to focus more now than ever. I mean, we've seen you know, countries that have never necessarily had to rely on community mechanisms for engagement strategies really have to do this now. And, and those, those, uh, those mechanisms may not have been in place in some Western European countries or in higher income countries, and yet they really needed them during, during, um, during this response. Uh, also, I think one of the trends we're starting to pick up is that individuals that rely on information through more, maybe more traditional media, um, maybe televised or written media, 
tend to not be so susceptible to disinformation because there's an opportunity to have more of a discourse in those types of media. So they can hear the pros, the cons, the arguments for and against, whereas potentially with social media, there's just little sort of snippets of information and not as much of a chance to sort of really um, dissect an issue. So we're tending, we're beginning to see that kind of trend as well. So where people seek their information could really have a factor on whether or not they're susceptible to, to disinformation. Great, and I, I have a question from the audience um, through the app. And by the way, if anyone in the room has questions, please feel free to, to go to the uh, mic in the corner here. Um, so, so one that I wanted to direct at, at Henry, how do you see the responsibility of vaccine producers and the medical establishment more widely for communicating to the public when governments are mistrusted? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and of course, um, vaccine producers uh, tend to be global pharmaceutical companies. They have quite large marketing budgets. I think you know um, it's in their interest to, uh, to actually use that to promote the vaccine. Um, to um, to uh, patients and customers, um, and and within that to identify um, exactly um, what kind of barriers there might be to uh, to promoting the vaccine uh, to them. I think in d doing that process, though, I think, um, and this is something not just for the vaccine uh, producers, but for us more generally, when we think about public health uh, as a national priority. Uh, at the moment is is the need to prioritize these different audiences and the last question about dividing lines I thought was you know a, a very good one because it really got to the heart of well what are the different motivations that people have or the different reasons that people have for being hesitant and, and some Melinda sort of picked out a really good uh, range uh, of them and you know at, at one end you have people yes that believe in conspiracy theories um, and, you know, that correlates with, um, in, in our research, looking at the UK, when we've tried to understand where disinformation lands and why it gets traction, we see that sort of the, the propensity to believe conspiracy theories actually correlates with the political extremes. And they're actually very hard audiences to win over. Um, but, but there's a spectrum and a range. It's not that there is a, a line over which suddenly someone doesn't want the vaccine. You know, there are a range of different... Um, different reasons that people are hesitant and 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 you know uh, in terms of reaching our goal in this instance which is vaccinating as many of the population as possible uh, in support of uh, our, our pathway out of the pandemic we need to prioritize those audiences and understand exactly how we can win over most of them and recognize that some of them will be unreconcilable um, and, you know, I think generally when we've thought about disinformation in other contexts, when we, for example, in the wake of the Salisbury attack, when the UK was dealing with a disinformation attack from uh, the Russian state, uh, we recognized that there were some audiences in the UK for whom the Russian state's narrative about the events um, would always resonate um, because they had, uh, because they inherently believe in these kind of conspiracy uh, theories. And uh, the important thing was that those uh, narratives didn't break into the mainstream and didn't start to influence, and they stay in these echo chambers uh, at, at, at each end of the political spectrum. Um, so recognizing which audiences we can actually uh, inform and bring accurate information to, I think, is, is key. And of course, yes, the vaccine producers play, play a role in that. That's a great point. And it's also such a dynamic environment. Um, in the UK, you're changing the guidance and which, or, or, and I guess in every country, which, which vaccines are coming online, which are being used. Um, I know in the US, uh, the vaccine, vaccine hesitancy has actually gotten better over time as more people are um, being vaccinated. And, you know, you talk to your friends and family and hear that maybe they didn't have a terrible experience and terrible side effects. And that increases your willingness to, um, to get the job. So, yeah, it's a, it's a highly dynamic and um, interesting and challenging environment. So we have a question here from the audience. Please um, introduce yourself and state the question as a question. Hi, uh, yes, uh, good morning. I'm Anja Nussbaum. I'm a journalist for Bloomberg News. Um, and I have a question about the need to uh, reconcile the legitimate um, queries about the origin, the legitimate need to, to, to query about the uh, origin of the virus 
and the need to fight conspiracy theories. And what I mean is that last year, a lot of us were very quick to dismiss um, uh, the, the thesis about the origin of the virus coming from Wuhan, accidental, non-accidental, doesn't matter. But a lot of us were very quick to dismiss that because it was a theory that was spread by Donald Trump, basically, and, and a certain part of the political spectrum. Uh, this year, the, this is being discussed again. You know, we're seeing more and more uh, questions from scientists about the origin of the virus. And whether or not uh, these, um, th these theories are true, uh, how do you reconcile the need to investigate uh, and uh, the need not to dismiss certain theories and the need to also, you know, uh, ma make sure that people don't, don't go crazy over, over crazy theories? That's a great <laughs> question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely great question. I think the issue always is when a legitimate question becomes politicized, because this is exactly what, what happened. You know, in the case of Donald Trump, it was so clear to everyone that there is an ulterior motive to this. And then it becomes really difficult to take this notion seriously. But I think the reconciling part um, comes when we, and this has been repeated so often during, during the pandemic that I'm not going to say anything new, but it's basically trusting the experts who are actually doing the research and giving them voice, which is not politicized, uh, and giving them the floor and the space to speak authoritatively on some of these things. And also um, it's about not jumping to conclusions very quickly, because I think it's okay to tell to your audience that this is, you know, one hypothesis and it's just one hypothesis which needs to be explored, which needs to be checked and then needs to be proven true or wrong, essentially. But um, there is a big difference between when somebody just like throws around, you know, these notions without any kind of evidence. So I think it's about and this sort of fits into a broader issue of how we even how the media and how politicians and how public authorities communicate potentially very complex issues to public audiences in an in an understandable manner essentially and it's very difficult so i understand like all majority of stakeholders made some mistakes over the past you know one and a half year in terms of communicating the pandemic because the situation developed so rapidly that actually having safe knowledge of of uh, what is actually going on is being constantly changed and updated but again i think that needs to be communicated to the audiences as well that okay this thing is new for all of us and we are still in the process of of finding out so if that is you know um, sort of communicated well, then I think the audiences are able to understand it. But people will always, you know, try to use these things for their political ends. So, I think from a journalist journalist perspective, um, this this intellectual humility too at the beginning of the pandemic to say, you know, there are there is tremendous uncertainty about Absolutely. the efficacy of face masks or about the origin of the virus, and to not be too quick to be reactionary as well. Um, we only have four and a half minutes left, and I did want to talk about um, solutions. So I'm curious, from your various perspectives, um, we're obviously living through these policy experiments all over the world, and whether you've seen particularly effective um, methods for combating disinformation and this longer term and more challenging project of building trust and, um, and education as well. Um, maybe we could start with Henry. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot of different bits to that question, and I'll try not to take up all the time. Um, but I think, I mean, quickly, from our perspective, strategic communications is, is, is a key lever in, uh, in promoting vaccine confidence. Um, and, you know, I touched earlier on, the on, on some of the things that make it effective. But in terms of um, in terms of particularly effective activity that we've seen and, uh, and support, uh, th there's a, um, uh, uh, an app game called uh, Go Viral, which was developed um, in partnership with the University of Cambridge um, that uses behavioral insights to, um, to inoculate um, uh, uh, the, uh, individuals against misinformation by having them play the part of someone that is spreading false information online in, in this simulation. Um, and it's been proven that just one play of the game 
uh, reduces uh, the perceived uh, reliability of fake news by an average of 21%. And their, their, their then immunity to uh, false information lasts up to three months. So it's important to note that all of these behavioral interventions do have a sort of skill fade to the nudge that you've uh, you've had with them. But yeah, we've translated that into m multiple languages and um, shared it with multiple partners. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's, it, it's proven to have a, a behavioral impact on them. I think longer term, uh, the importance, uh, the important thing for, for us, and I think uh, it's reflected by some of our allies, is thinking about about three things. And it's, it's, it's stuff that's reflected in the UK's recent integrated review, which is a review, review of security and defense, but of course features uh, health security uh, more than previous reviews have. And uh, all of, uh, all of uh, our security priorities need to be based on uh, on building resilience, uh, on, on sharing and promoting our values, and then finally, of course, on international cooperation with, uh, with other nations and, and with multilateral organizations. And I think those are, those are the things that will help us build trust. Those are the things that will help us uh, through the pandemic. And those are the things uh, that will help us build back better as the world. And Melinda? Um, I'll echo some of what Henry said too. I think uh, at least at the World Health Organization, we are looking at ways to help countries and communities become more resilient for the next uh, pandemic or next emergency, because there will be one, unfortunately. Uh, some of the things we're doing uh, to help countries really begin to regain more of that trust factor before the next emergencies. We've started a new platform. It's a country-based tool called the Early AI Supported Response with Social Listening. It enables countries to kind of pick up potential mis and disinformation in their own information ecosystem um, in their country. And it also allows them to triangulate other epidemiologic data to kind of really see what's going on in their own country. We're supporting that. We also have a research agenda for infodemics so we can learn more about the impact of the infodemic, the spread of information and misinformation, and really to learn more about the tools and the mechanisms that we can employ that may help uh, decrease the amount of misinformation, disinformation, um, and help to inoculate the population against that too. So these are some of the things we're looking forward to in the future. And I guess what, yeah, the other major theme here that we keep touching on is obviously yeah, this, this building trust in, in populations and down to the level of specific communities. So to wrap up, could we talk a little bit right about what governments should be doing now um, to prepare for the next one? And this is, yes, there, there was an audience member who had a question along these lines in, term, in terms of communications. Um, what should we be doing now to prepare the public for the next pandemic? Mm -hmm. So this is a tough one for some governments. Obviously, the UK is doing really well. So I think it's always good to share best practice and, and learn from those who are really succeeding, you know, because there are plenty of countries also in CEE who are struggling with this part and who are not being trusted um, by their constituents because um, they are considered to have, um, you know, dealt with the second wave of the pandemic really poorly, as we have now um, we all know that the CEE has been very much, very badly affected by the second wave of the pandemic. So rebuilding trust in such an environment is extremely difficult. But I do believe that we've mentioned it already, efficient strategic communication is absolutely the key. But also, um, you know, it's about creating really modern campaigns, information campaigns, which could actually reach those who, who need to who need to get vaccinated. And this has proven to be a problem in some countries. Um, obviously, the willingness to get vaccinated has increased, so that's the good news. And there are also large pockets of people who are undecided about vaccination. So across the E, there's like 20% of the population. So if governments focus their efforts on, on actually these undecided, um, undecided constituents, then perhaps, you know, um, that's one way of overcoming, hopefully, this one pandemic. And in the long term, it's all about building efficient institutions. But that's obviously not something you can, you know, change within half a year or a year. That's definitely a long term project. And the, the other long term project that I'm picking up on, we need to clone Henry or send him to um, yeah, these different places to replicate the UK experience. Um, no, that, that's really helpful. Um, was there anything that Henry and Melinda wanted to add? 
Uh, well, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. Um, uh, we do work internationally with a lot of our partners to help build strategic communications capability. And I think, you know, it's important to recognize that, um, that, uh, that the UK is uh, very keen to make sure that, that we help as many of our partners as possible. And just on that great point about, you know, what, what prepares us for the next pandemic, I think the way we make our way out of this pandemic uh, will build trust. We should do it in a way that means that we um, build trust, that means that the world will be more ready for the next one. And of course, you know, sharing vaccines is is going to be a key part of that. And that's why we were delighted that one of the outcomes of the G7 uh, summit uh, earlier this week was that uh, the announcement of uh, a billion vaccines to be donated to uh, lower income countries. Um, and, you know, it's that kind of display uh, and, you know, symbolic gesture uh, of our values that will ensure there is a trust in the international system that uh, that we will come out of this uh, as, as a globe next time. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you so, so much, everyone, for, for joining online, on the app, in the audience, in Geneva, in London. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it seems like there are no really easy solutions to this problem, and we need to start certainly thinking about the next one right now. Um, so thank you for sharing all your insights and thanks for joining today. Thank you for the discussion. Yeah, great.